Welcome to Revealing Jesus. Are you hungry to learn more about our beautiful Savior Jesus? I am your host, Christina Pereira, lover of Jesus, apostolic leader, licensed and ordained minister, author, podcaster, and kingdom party planner. Did you know that the Bible declares that grace and peace are multiplied to us in the knowledge of Jesus? And that simply means the more we learn about our beautiful Savior, the more we will experience all He died to give us. Join me for all things the King and His Kingdom, including revelatory teaching, interviews with Bible ministers, media leaders, authors, and more. Come discover the beauty of God displayed all across the body of Christ. Together, we are revealing more of Jesus to a hurting world today. When we admit brokenness, then we move beyond behavior modification and we can actually experience the heart transformation that Jesus wants to bring to our lives. But before we get started, I want to give a quick shout out to our Christina Prayer Ministry sponsors who help support the mission to unite the body of Christ and fulfill the Great Commission with love. A big shout out to Go For Ministries who provides all of our equipment for our gospel events. Davis Financial Services, who does all of our financial accounting. Harvest Family Network, through which I am licensed and ordained. And Life Changing Productions, who helps put together evangelistic events to reach our city for Jesus. If you or your organization are interested in becoming a CPM sponsor, you can find out more information on our website at ChristinaPereira.org. Do you have a loved one special occasion coming up and don't know what to get them? Well, now you can sponsor an episode of Revealing Jesus in their name. And you can give them a special dedication message read on air. It makes a great gift. To find out more information, just go to christinapereira.org slash podcast. Hey, everybody. Thanks so much for tuning into this week's episode of Revealing Jesus with Christina Pereira. I am your host, Christina, and I'm so excited to have you with me here today. I hope and I pray that you are doing well right where you are and enjoying the continuously flowing favor of grace pouring from our beautiful Savior and Father in heaven. I've got a great show for you today. I have an amazing leader in the body of Christ with me today. He is an author, a speaker, a pastor, and he has dedicated his life to helping people experience the life changing power of authenticity. And he is the author of the new book, Being Real, Greater Than Being Perfect, How Transparency Leads to Transformation. I have with me here today, Justin Davis. Justin, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much, Christina, for having me. I'm excited to be here. Oh, thank you. Well, I absolutely love the fact that you're a fellow podcaster. So we are going to have a fantastic conversation today. And uh, I just love vulnerability and honesty. And uh, when I saw your book, I thought, yes, yes, Lord, this is something (laughs) that your people desperately, desperately need. So thank you for this. Oh, thank you so much. I really appreciate the encouragement and just the affirmation of the message. Yeah, he's so good. And, you know, I love that Jesus is so real with us. Mm -hmm. And he's so very interested in the people that we truly are. His gaze and his focus is always for us. And it's always to engage with our true hearts and our minds and who we are because he loves us so. Absolutely. I think so often how we view God and how we view our relationship with Christ, it determines how authentic we are in return. And so the hope of the book is to really help the reader you know, reassess the vulnerability of Jesus and how we can be vulnerable with him and to experience the life transformation that we desire. Yes, very much so, because it's all about connection. I think he said this to me many, 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 many years ago. You don't spend eternity in the arms of your ministry. You spend eternity in the arms of your Savior. Hmm. And so at the end of the day, all that we do and all that we have comes down to that relationship with Jesus. Amen. And really, that's what matters. Absolutely. Yeah. So since this is Revealing Jesus, I have to ask you how you met our beautiful Savior, Jesus. Well, I think I have kind of a conversion experience that is in kind of two parts. I grew up in church. My parents started going to church when I was really young. 
And so church camp was a part of our regular kind of summer routine. And I grew up really poor. And so I was typically on scholarship. And I think it was a great break for my parents to get all of us out of the house at the same time to go to camp. And so, you know, growing up in church and really understanding knowledge about Jesus at an early age. And then I accepted Christ when I was 10 at church camp, was baptized after that. And I don't know that I fully conceptualized, you know, the commitment and the decision that I was making. I was authentically repentant and sorry for the 10 years of, you know, sinfulness and lawlessness that I experienced. <laughs> but it, I don't know that I had the capacity. I, I knew I loved God and I knew that God had a plan for my life, but to conceptualize God's grace and mercy. And so middle school and high school were just kind of an up and down hot and cold, mediocre relationship with Christ. And then I actually went to Bible college to become a pastor. And it was really through that process of kind of my sophomore year of college where I rededicated my life to Christ. And I'd experienced some things in my life personally and some things in my family's life that really I had to lean in to the grace of God more. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. I, I didn't feel like God was getting a good deal with me anymore. I knew how broken Aww. I was, you know, and, and really kind of began to understand the love of Christ and then dedicated my life to not only him again, but also to vocational ministry. Mm, yeah, it's so true. It's hard to really, really grasp the gravity of everything as a child. And it's always a journey. Yeah. And unfortunately, hardships and things he uses so powerfully to bring us into that grace that you talked about. It's hard to really appreciate grace unless you've really, really struggled. Not that he ever authors it, but he can use it because he's that good. Yeah. You know? Amen to that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Thank you so much for sharing that. Yeah. Well, I have absolutely loved reading through your book, Being Real, Greater Than Being Perfect. And I feel like there's so many things we could talk about here. But one thing that's really standing out to me is realizing that our brokenness is not necessarily weakness. Yeah. Talk about that a little bit. Yeah. And so when I began to, you know, kind of assess my own life and my own relationship with God, I think that so many of us who call ourselves Christians, we have this gap between who we are and who we think God's called us to be. Or there's a gap between who we really are and who we want to be in Christ, right? And so even though we've accepted grace and accepted Christ and all that he did on the cross for us, we still have a performance track that's buried deep within us that I think we're constantly trying to prove ourselves to God or be good enough or be acceptable enough. And I find that so many Christ followers are discouraged or defeated or just disillusioned with the fact that they're never really going to be able to measure up. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't think that that is actually a bad thing. I think it's a, gr a great thing, realizing that we are never going to, in our own accord, in our own strength, we're never going to be able to attain holiness, right? That holiness doesn't come from us. Holiness mm -hmm. comes through Christ. And so mm -hmm. the idea that brokenness is not weakness is, it's only as we admit our brokenness and it's only as we admit our dependence and our need for Jesus that we're able to live out the passage where Paul says it's in our weakness that he becomes strong. And I think what happens so often, at least for me, I'm not going to speak for everyone, but as a pastor, as a follower of Christ, you know, for the last 40 years, uh, 40 years of following Christ, 20 years as a pastor, for me, I pretend to be closer to God than I really am, and mm. I pretend to not be weak. And when we act like we have it all together, or we act like we're not weak or we're not broken, then we rob ourselves of the power of the Holy Spirit mm -hmm. to bring us a power and to bring us a transformation that no effort or no pretending or no faking will ever be able to bring to our hearts. And so the idea is that when we admit brokenness, then we move beyond behavior modification and we can actually experience the heart transformation that Jesus wants to bring to our lives. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And I just want to say this. I think there's a pressure out there for Christian leaders, specifically pastors, 
because in large part, they've been made the focus as heads of ministry that really where the focus is, it should be on Jesus. You know, we're seeing right now, just in the past few years, like rumblings of major heads of leaders, like struggling with issues and people are shocked when they fall. And I got to be honest with you, I'm not shocked. I'm not shocked. Right. Yeah. And we, we shouldn't be mm-hmm. because they are real human beings desperately dependent on a perfect savior, something that we, we all are. Right. Um, just because you're a Christian leader, it doesn't mean that you are somehow immune to uh, being human. Yeah. Yeah. And I would truly, truly love to see people honored in the body of Christ for what they do and not for their perfection. Yeah. Yeah. And it's important. I think we do a disservice to them as leaders who people who are pouring out their lives when we demand perfection from them. Right. Because I'm sure as a Christian leader, you can talk about the pressure behind it. It's too much and it's inhuman and who can bear it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, you spoke so eloquently about this, but there is an elevation and there's a pedestal that Mm -hmm. we put Christian leaders on and sometimes ahead of Christ. You know, like, I don't think we do it, but I think a few years ago, I don't know if you saw this, but there was like a knockoff of American Idol and it was called Christian Idol. And I'm like, really? Like, I never (laughs) saw that. Maybe it's good that I You know what I mean? Like, how can those two things even go together? You know what I mean? And and so, but I do think that even though we don't say it or name it or, you know, verbally acknowledge it, there is a subtlety and elevation of Christian leaders or Christian popular people or people who have platforms to a place that we look to them before we look to the scriptures. We look to them before we look to the Holy Spirit. We look to them before we look to Jesus. And I think that's a really dangerous aspect of not just our culture, but Christian culture in general. Mm -hmm. And it creates a toxicity that we should not be surprised when we see some of the you know, church scandals and some of the pastoral abuse that's taken place. It's because we have elevated the power of the individual and minimized the power of the Holy Spirit to actually bring life and transformation into the lives of the people that are in our churches. Mm -hmm. That's so good. You know, this just happened a couple of weeks ago, and I feel like I need to share this. So I was at uh, Voice of the Apostles just a couple of weeks ago. And there was a gentleman who was sitting beside me and a very well-known preacher or apostolic leader was teaching. And he said, I wish he was my dad. And I turned to him and I said, I've got really good news for you. I said, he gets all his wisdom from your heavenly father as well. And Mm. he was like, oh, thank you. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) Because I think when we see it as, oh, this person has this and I need this from them. We are elevating them above Jesus and we are elevating them above our heavenly father through whom everything comes. And the truth is, is that if we possess humility, we can always go to God and say, God, I can't, but you can. I'm in need of this. I'm in need of wisdom. I am in need of your grace. I am in need of your strength. And I think true humility comes out of that brokenness, seeing that we can't, but God can. Yeah. But that we are inherently bankrupt. Yeah, yeah. And he is inherently full. Right, right. And so when you have a bankrupt person and a full person who's willing to give generously yeah. without reproach, there should be no issue. Right, right, right. Yeah, I mean, I think that that's a really important aspect of humility is realizing that without Jesus, I have no hope, you know, but for the grace of God, there is no hope. And I think so often in Christianity, we can get into a mindset that I have to try harder and I have to earn what God has so freely given, you know, and I think we shouldn't live in the past, but Paul calls himself the chief of all sinners. He was the greatest Mm -hmm. evangelist of all time. And yet he recognized his propensity to disappoint God, to sin, and it, it elevated his dependence on God, mm-hmm. right? It wasn't, th- you know, Pastor Rick Warren says, humility isn't thinking less of yourself, it's thinking of yourself less, right? And, and so 
when we think of ourselves less then who fills in the vacuum it's Jesus right and so it's not necessarily this isn't self-deprecating faith it's more of man i'm going to elevate the strengths of god and the grace of jesus so much more and it gives me permission then to admit fault to admit weakness to say i don't have it all together and life is really hard and complicated right now but i don't have to have it figured out because i have a heavenly father who goes before me and he stands beside me and he fights my battles in you know in my defense and so i think that is kind of a key and one of the principles you know that i talk about in the book of realizing that brokenness isn't weakness it's not necessarily having a bad view of yourself it's really having just an amazing view of all that jesus can and will do for us amen I love that so much. And you, know, there's such freedom in losing sight of ourselves and having our focus on Jesus. Yeah. That's where the true transformation and true power comes from. There's a reason why he killed you off. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Are you a new believer in Jesus and don't know where to start? First, let me say welcome to the family of God. It's so important to anchor yourself in the gospel and the finished work of Jesus. This powerful workbook includes foundational gospel truths to anchor your heart in new covenant reality and interactive journaling prompts to begin your relationship with Jesus. This workbook includes teaching based on the Word of God. It will help you understand precisely why you need a Savior, what Jesus has done for you, your new creation life in Him, and how to have a relationship with Him. Journal through the pages to dive deep into the heart of God for you as his child and increase your faith as you learn about our beautiful Savior. Be sure to pick up a copy of New Believer Workbook, Foundational Gospel Truths to Begin Your Relationship with Christ Jesus today. Links in the show notes or you can pick up a copy at Amazon or ChristinaPereira.org slash store. Right, where you, you know, that's, yeah, I mean, dying... Taking up your cross and following him is not uh, CrossFit. It's not recreation, right? There's a sacrifice yeah. to that, right? And I think yeah. so often we want to, you know, live out that verse to live as Christ, but then we don't want to live the second part to die as gain. <laughs> yeah, that's right. And I think if we continue to study what the gospel actually says, it says that we've been crucified to the mm. world and the world to us. We yeah. are dead absolutely yeah. dead so that we can live for God. You know, many, many years ago when the Lord was, was, was teaching me, he gave me this writing and he titled it Perfecting the Dead. And mm. so much of Christianity right now is so consumed with perfecting the dead man that Christ killed off. And so I think- Oh, that when, is good. Yeah. I love yes, that. Very much so. And yeah. it, it leads to bondage and it leads to immovability. That's yeah. right where the enemy wants us. Because if we're so consumed with ourselves and we're not gazing at Jesus, we are immovable. We are no longer a threat, mm -hmm. if that makes any sense. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I, I love that. It's such a good picture. And really, you know, one of the reasons why I felt like the book is needed is because I feel like more people are going to church today than any time in human history, yet very few people are changing. Mm -hmm. And it's because yeah. we're singing the songs, we're praying the prayers, we're joining small groups, we're serving in the nursery because that's extra credit in heaven. That's a joke. <laughs> but, you know, we're not experiencing that life transformation. And I think it's just exactly yeah. why what you just talked about is we're trying to perfect a person that is dead mm -hmm. and not necessarily embracing the person who has been resurrected and who is yeah. actually capable of the transformation that we desire. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think that's the enemy's point because we are no longer a threat if we are so inwardly focused on ourselves and our own shortcomings, fault findings, failures, sins, all of that. But if we are looking to the person of Jesus, that's when we become the faith-filled powerhouses that yeah. he's created us to be. Yeah. And I'm so thankful he killed us off. Isn't it amazing? <laughs> Amen to that. <laughs> so good. Well, there's a story, and I want to talk about this. You shared this in that same chapter, re realizing that our brokenness is not weakness. 
Um, you shared the story of the woman who anointed Jesus' feet at the home of the Pharisees. I want to talk mm-hmm. about that. Yeah. So for those that may be familiar, maybe for those that maybe aren't as familiar with the story, Simon the Pharisee invites Jesus over to his house for a dinner. And in any Jewish custom, you know, in Jewish cult- culture, this would have been a very big deal for a religious leader to invite another recognized religious leader over for dinner. And there were certain customs that took place in that culture, not just for esteemed guests, but for anyone. One of those customs would have been a kiss of greeting that would have been much like a handshake is for us today. They would have exchanged a kiss of greeting once the person arrived at the home. The next thing would have been the washing of feet. And this is something that took place every time someone came into another person's home Much like we would take our shoes off, they would wash their feet because, you know, obviously they traveled by foot and had dirt roads. And so if the guest was of high honor, the host would wash the feet of the guest himself. If he was not of high honor, then at minimum, a servant would wash the guest's feet, but the guest's feet would be washed. And then if the guest was of high esteem, there would have been what would be called the anointing of oil. And this Mm -hmm. was basically just a rubbing on the forehead of olive oil. And it was a sign of refreshment. It was a sign of, hey, I know you've traveled a long distance, or I know that your journey was not easy. I Mm -hmm. want you to feel refreshed. And it was a a welcome. It was like a hug that we would give as someone came into our home. Well, Jesus arrives at the home of Simon, and none of that takes place. There's no kiss of greeting. There's no anointing of oil, and there's no washing of feet. And in that culture, if you can imagine, dinner parties would have taken place kind of on the back deck of a home. So they were outside in the courtyard and only people who were invited to the party could be seated at the table, but anyone could watch. Anyone could come around and gather in the courtyard and observe the dinner. And we don't know, there's not really a lot of context given, but my assumption would be that the sinful woman who the the Greek word there is that it implies that she was professionally sinful. So she was probably a prostitute. She must have seen the absence of these customs. She must have seen Simon ignore Jesus, and she can't help herself. She Mm -hmm. falls at Jesus' feet. She begins to cry and weep, and the tears start streaming down her cheeks, falling off of her face and onto the feet of Jesus. She then takes down her hair, which would have been a very scandalous thing to do in public because it would also imply that she removed a veil that was probably over her face. She takes down her hair, then she takes an alabaster jar of perfume, and many of the scholars in that day, or many of the scholars say about that passage that in that day, that would have been about a year's worth of wages. It would have been worth that much. And she pours it out on the feet of Jesus and begins to wipe his feet with her hair and her tears. And this huge kind of moment happens at dinner where Jesus says to Simon, one of my favorite parts of this story is when Jesus It says that Jesus turned to the woman, but said to Simon, and he said, do you see this woman? And how I read it is, I know that you have looked at her, but do you actually see her? Then he starts recounting all of the customs that weren't followed. I came into your home. There was no kiss of greeting. I came to your home. There was no washing of feet. I came into your home. There was no anointing of oil. And this woman has poured her life out. She's poured her tears out and she can't stop kissing my feet. And it was just this picture of how religion can put us at the table with Jesus, but only brokenness will put us at his feet. Mm -hmm. And then you see something move from a physical act to a spiritual reality. He says, though her sins are many, they are now forgiven. And so this act of brokenness, this act of weakness that she demonstrates in the posture of humility is That demonstration, it moves the heart of Jesus so much that he forgives her sin. And I think there were, you know, Simon knew that there was a big sinner at the table. He didn't realize it was him. Yes. (laughs) Yes. And so, you know, I think he knew that there was somebody there that needed grace. And that's what religion does to us, right? It allows us to see the sin of others, but we neglect the actual sin in our own hearts. And so Jesus forgives the sin of the, of the woman and tells her to leave your life of sin. What's interesting, Christina, is we learn later in John's gospel that this woman is identified by John as Mary, the sister of Martha and Lazarus. 
And so she did leave her life of sin, and she began to travel with Jesus and be a part of his ministry and has such a significant role in the gospel story of Christ. And we see her, you know, elevated by the gospel writers several times throughout the gospels after this event takes place. Mm -hmm. It was so interesting to me uh, when I was reading through that this morning, I was seeing something else in there. Yes, I would 100% agree with you that uh, he thought there was a sinner in the room and at the table, but he didn't realize it was him. The truth is, is that we have all been forgiven much. There is not one of us who has been forgiven little. Right. And that's why we have the need for a Savior, Jesus. Yes. And that is important to denote there. But it was so interesting to me as I was reading through that this morning in your book, I saw something. And so she saw a Savior. And the Pharisees saw a religious leader whose authority he was questioning. Yeah. If this man is a prophet, he would know who she is, right? Right, right. And so religion always questions the authority and power of Jesus. But those who are consumed with the Savior, those are the people who receive the grace and the goodness and the yeah. mercy. And Jesus, in his rebuke, it does it with the utmost love because there was one person in that room who was in danger of eternal damnation and it wasn't the woman. Yeah. Oh, that's so good. Yeah. Yeah. Your perspective is just so refreshing. It's a unique position of, you know, just the authority that when we are living out of religion and not out of relationship, we do question the authority of Christ and we become our own God in that moment. Very much so. Yeah. Very much so. And so I'm so thankful that Jesus, in his kindness, he rebukes the sinful one in that room. Yeah. And, you know, as long as our eyes are on ourselves and we're not focused on Jesus, we're in danger. Yeah. But if our eyes are focused on the one who is altogether lovely, the one who is immensely forgiving, the one who is eternally supplying, the one who is conscious of his goodness towards us and not our goodness, that we are the one in the right place at the right time with the right person. So oh, that's good. Yeah. So good. Yeah. Well, this has been so, so fun. I've loved our conversation. Is there anything burning on your heart you'd like to say directly to our listeners? I think if, you know, if what we've been talking about kind of is, is stirring in you and the Holy Spirit's like prompting you of like, man, I do feel like I'm more in the vein of performing for God than living at the feet of Jesus. I just want to encourage you that forgiveness was available to everyone at the table. Mm -hmm. If Simon would have recognized his yeah. brokenness, forgiveness was available to him. So it doesn't matter where you are in your relationship with God today. He is waiting and available for you to come to him, to fall at his feet and to pour your life out to him. And he sees you and he forgives you. And then he also provides a way for you to experience the life transformation that we see Mary experience in the gospels and to live your life following Christ and sharing with others the message of Jesus. So good. So good. Will you pray for our listeners today? I would love that to. That they would come to the feet of Jesus Absolutely. Oh, God, we just thank you so much for this conversation today and just how where two or more are gathered, you were there. And so there are two gathered on this podcast, but there are so many more gathered listening. And so we thank you for your presence. We thank you that you see us and you know us and you long to live in a relationship with us. And so, God, I pray for the person listening that may be going through marital problems or financial issues or family drama. God, maybe it's a loss of a job or the loss of a loved one. That you are not a God who sits far off and observes our life. You walk with us. You live in us. You are near to those that are struggling and brokenhearted and confused and doubting. You do not judge us. You forgive us. And you say that there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. 
And so, God, we pray that you continue to move us from the table to your feet and allow us to experience the life transformation that you desperately and longingly want to give us. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much. That was so wonderful. I know that's going to bless so many people. Thank Um, you so much for having me. Of course. Well, I hope and I pray today's episode has blessed you. I will have links from today's podcast and resources under Revealing Jesus with Christina Prayer, wherever you get your podcasts. And there you'll find additional resources to connect with us and our special guest, Justin Davis. And be sure to pick up a copy of his new book, Being Real, Greater Than Being Perfect. Until next week, may grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of Jesus. God bless. Beloved, let me introduce you to my King. He is altogether lovely. No matter which way you turn him, he is perfection personified. He is velvet and steel. He is meekness and majesty. He is glory and humility. He is kindness and strength. He is altogether lovely. And he is my King. And he can be yours as well. All day long, he holds his hand that you might take, that you might turn one step, one grasp, one yes, one breath away from the arms of your loving Savior. Beloved, if you hear him calling today, do not harden your heart. The Bible declares that not one of us is guaranteed another moment upon this earth. So pray this prayer with me today and run into the arms of the one who loves you, who knows you best. Father, I ask you to forgive me for all of my sin, for all of the places that I have fallen short, God, of your glorious standard. I ask you now to send your Son into my heart to be the forgiveness of my sin, to be my redemption, to be my righteousness, to be my holiness, to be my sanctification. I ask you to forgive me, to cleanse me, to fill me with your Spirit, your power, your glory, that I might bring glory to your name, Father. I thank you that I receive all of this by faith in the Son of God who loved me and who gave himself up for me. I thank you that I am now a child of God, fully forgiven, fully righteous, fully holy in your eyes. And I ask you to help me walk out this life in a way that pleases and honors you, Father. I thank you, Jesus, for all that you've done. I thank you for your love, for your kindness, for your great joy in saving me. And I thank you, Father, and I thank you, Holy Spirit. And I pray all of these things in your beautiful Son's name. Amen. If you've just prayed that prayer for the first time, I want to congratulate you. You are now a child of God, and all things are now yours. Keep listening to Revealing Jesus. Find a good Bible translation that makes sense to you. And keep hearing about our beautiful Savior Jesus. Please let us know. We want to continue to pray for you, and we want to send you a free PDF copy of our new Believer Workbook. Just go to christinaperrera.org slash welcome hyphen home. Enter your email address and we will be happy to send this free gift and continue to pray for your journey. God bless. I sincerely hope and pray today's episode has blessed you. Now it's your turn to continue the conversation. We are all evangelists of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Like this episode, rate it, share it with a friend. If it's impacted your life, let them know that you want it to do the same and theirs. Help spread the word of the good news of Jesus. Subscribe to the mailing list and get episodes, articles, downloads, and more sent right to you. Link in show notes or just text Jesus to 1-833-815-7778. Again, that's Jesus, 1-833-815-7778. 
We would love to connect with you on social media. You can find us at Christina Prayer Ministries on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. Until next week, may grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of Jesus. God bless.